pop up live. Welcome to this afternoon's live stream, everybody. This is the video that I really, really wanted to show you yesterday. This is a video that I was wanting to show you when I was having the technical difficulty. I could not get the video I wanted to show you. So I am super excited to give this to you now. This is the highlight, just the highlights of Wendy Adelson's testimony. And I'll get into who she is, give you a little brief description. But one of the things I wanted to do was make sure that you could, you didn't have to watch the entire four hours of her testimony. You could just watch the highlights and I'll walk you through it and explain what it's about and everything. Quick, quick graphic. Hey, everybody. Good to see y'all coming into the live. So we've been covering this case. It's just started to trial this past week. I should say it just started to trial this time around because there have already been two trials. Now, Dan Markell was an FSU law professor who was murdered. And the three people you see on the bottom, Katie Mabanawa, Sigfrido Garcia, and Luis Rivera, they're all already in jail, convicted. Garcia and Rivera, the hitmen. Katie Mabanawa, the one who paid them, hired them. But the state says that the plot to kill Dan Markell doesn't stop there, that Charlie Adelson was the one who actually hired Katie, gave her the money to pay the two hit men. So Charlie Adelson, uh, you'll see the entire Adelson family because Wendy, Charlie, and Donna for sure have been named by the state as suspects and Harvey is the dad. Wendy was married to Dan Markell. Her husband, Charlie, is her brother. And Donna and Harvey are their parents. And according to the state, the reason that the Adelsons wanted Dan Markell dead, even though he and Wendy were already divorced, is because they were concerned that they weren't getting to see the grandkids enough. The grandkids were in North Florida and the Adelsons lived in South Florida. But Dan Markell wouldn't agree to move. He taught law, after all, at FSU, and so it wasn't all that easy to move. So what we are going to be doing today, this week, marked the beginning of the trial of Charlie Adelson. Katie Mabanawa was tried separately. She was first tried with Sigfrido Garcia. Luis Rivera pled guilty. The two of them, Garcia and Mabanawa, were tried together, and there was a hung jury as to Katie, so they tried her again, and at that point she was convicted. So now... It's years now after the murder, 2014 was when Dan Markell was killed. And now for the first time, uh, and Adelson is going to trial. Charlie Adelson is going to trial. His sister, Wendy, testified. And that is super important, super important because she is part of, well, she's the centerpiece of the reason why the state says they killed Dan Markell in the first place. This is her third time testifying, but it's the most important. And it's the first time she's ever had somebody cross-examine her in a way that invited her to tell some of what we expect to be her side of the story. She has not been charged. Donna Adelson has not been charged. Harvey Adelson, not charged, but they have been in writing named as suspects by the state. So that's where everything stands there. I want to, right, what I've done is just go to the highlights. And sometimes I'll start kind of in the middle. So I'm going to explain it a little bit as I go. So it can be as short as possible, but still get, allow you to understand what it is that she's saying in, the, in this particular case. So with no further ado, let's go to Wendy's test. I want to direct your attention to an interview that was conducted on, I think this was your... Sorry to interrupt already, but this is the state asking her questions. Law enforcement interview. So July 18th, 2014, says Ms. Adelson, you know, my parents are, you know, very angry toward him. Is that true? Can I read the rest of the sentence? Uh, sure. So I say, you know, my parents are very angry towards him, but even when they're around my kids, they would never say a bad word about my kid's father. Didn't you say, you know, it's like my parents have more reason to dislike Danny than almost anyone else. That is what I said. And I was saying that in the context of talking to law enforcement for hours and hours and trying to help them figure out who might be responsible. Right. And who did you tell them might be responsible? Well, I told them many, many people. Okay. And of the lots of people that could have been responsible, your family as well. Yep. 
this is an explanation of why I've if some people have said they really don't think Wendy was a good witness. I think this is pretty effective because what she she takes the document and says, let me read some more from it. Let me tell you a little bit more. Now, the state wants to say that, and it's true, <laughs> when she was interviewed by the police right after the murder, one of the first things that popped out of her mouth was, huh, you know, my my family really hates him. It couldn't be my family, could it? And she planted the initial idea really with the police that it could be her family. It does make it seem less like she's involved just because of the fact that she says that she brings it up. And that seems like a really odd thing to do if she knew she was involved in a group plan by all the Adelsons to murder Dan Markell. It seems bizarre that she would bring that up. But apparently she did. Apparently she brought it up. In, in, but she, considering how effective this piece of evidence against her and against Charlie Adelson is, she handles it fairly well. It's not an easy thing to handle. But as a witness goes, I think she did pretty well on that, particularly by taking it, the document and reading a little bit more that put it into more context. Now, the relationship between Dan and Wendy after their divorce was extremely bitter and just not too long, about three or four months before Dan Markell was murdered, he had filed a pleading. It was really about four months, I think. He had filed a pleading asking that Donna Adelson, this is Wendy's mother, not be allowed to see her grandkids except on supervised visitation. And let's hear a little bit about that. And by the way, the reason we're going to hear a little bit more later from some other clips had to do with the fact that according to Dan Markell, he understood that Donna Adelson was running, running him down around the kids, was saying bad things about him and turning the kids against him. Did your mother, Donna Adelson, re review the uh, filing where Dan Markell is asking that your mother not be permitted to have unsupervised visitation with the kids? My mom never saw that because after he filed that, he then asked my parents to babysit the kids. And my mom baked him banana bread, gave him a hug goodbye. What was the most important part? Of the divorce for my mom. Yes. It says here that for her, it was relocation. In other Did words- mom call Dan they any out. disparaging names around this time frame? Another bribe to get him to allow relocation should be the offer of plane tickets so that he can fly back and forth, right? So you're going to potentially offer this big monetary benefit that would allow him to fly back and forth to work. Is that the idea? I never said that I was going to do any of that. Okay. Was that the idea that your mom had? That was the idea. All right. And the amount of the bribe is going to be, or was at least discussed as being a million dollars. Is that right? That is what they said. Well, then why wasn't it offered? Because I didn't want to do it. All right, what about the idea that you could try to threaten Dan to convert the kids to Christianity so that they can fit into the Bible Belt here in Tallahassee? Is that something your mom suggested in these emails? My mom did suggest that. Okay, and, and did you do any of those things? No, I don't even think I responded to it. Do you know whether the uh, defendant, your brother Charlie, was supportive of the plan to convert them or pose as converting them to Christianity? I, no idea. I don't think he was particularly involved in this round of my mom's On emails. page 11 of the exhibit, there's an indication from your mom that Charlie it, at least has discussed this with her and maybe is somewhat supportive. Charlie brought up a good point when he said that Americans were dropped behind enemy lines during World War II wearing Nazi uniforms to get what they wanted. They had a job to get done and they did what they needed to do to accomplish it. You have a job to get done in a very short time frame to accomplish it. If you dressed your kids up in Hitler youth uniforms and brought them down here, I could care less if it was an act of defiance that would show gibbers that he's all caps and bold, not in control. So it just seems like your mom was pretty extreme about this situation of getting you relocated. Can I you agree was, with that? Yeah. All right. And Charlie was at least consulted on it or had offered some information about it. 
Well, that was my mom's rendition, so I don't know if that's what actually happened or that was her perception. And so I had to laugh when <laughs> the first time I heard that. Seems like your mom was pretty extreme because you think <laughs> I mean, this was really, really extreme. You have to remember the Adelsons shared a common Jewish faith and background with Dan, with Dan Markell. So the idea that they would go so far as to claim they were going to convert the children to Christianity or dress them in Nazi uniforms, that's really, really extreme. They share the same Jewish background and heritage. So what, <laughs> what could she possibly mean? It does seem really extreme. I thought it was wise of Wendy to just acknowledge, yeah, that was really extreme. It certainly paints Donna Adelson as someone over the top, someone who was willing to do whatever it took to get her grandbabies down in Florida, which definitely seems like it puts her in the camp of somebody who might do something really extreme to make that happen. But they do have one really good point that I didn't get a clip of. All these plans, for example, the million dollars to pay Dan Markell, they were clear that the purpose of the million dollars was not to bribe him to go away and ignore his children, but was to allow him to relocate to Florida and cover all the flights back up to FSU where he taught. And so they even apparently ran that by an attorney. Their argument being, well, hey, if we're going to run stuff by an attorney, we're the kind of people who are trying to do things right. We're not the kind of people who are going to go out and break the law, which by definition, hiring somebody to murder somebody is really, really breaking the law. But it, I thought that Wendy did a good job of also talking about how Charlie was not really involved. She, oh, this is my mom. This isn't really Charlie since he's the one on trial. My brother wasn't really involved, but the prosecutor then did a really good job bringing it back to, well, Apparently, he was consulted. Look, he's the one who brought up the point about Americans being dropped behind enemy lines. So he was involved, too, and the prosecution brought that up, roped it back in. On page 379, um, Dan suggests that the court send a strong message about your malfeasance by awarding him the entirety of the undisclosed assets of over $200,000, right? That is what he asked for. Okay, and then on March 10th of 2014, on page 437. Oh, I should, do let me you stop respond? For a minute. So what they've done now, remember I cut it really brutally so that I could get it to just a little bit where we could talk about it. What we're talking about now is the divorce pleadings. That I Remember I told you they plumped a large notebook up there and they asked her, you know, this huge thing, this is your divorce pleading, right? And it's, all of the venomous back and forth motions or pleadings between Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson as they were not only going through their divorce, but then going through the custody battles that followed. And with your motion to dismiss the former husband's counter motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement that we just talked about. So it's getting personal. Then six days later, Dan files another motion seeking action against your mother, and that's the one we've already touched on. On three specific occasions in November 2013, the children informed Mr. Mark, Abba, Dad, Grandma says you're stupid. When, when queried as to why Grandma, the maternal grandmother, would say such things, the children replied jointly that it is because she says you are trying to take her sunshines away from her. And continue, please. In December uh, 2013, you don't have to say the name. Yeah. Your child. My child, the younger son, further stated to Mr. Markell in front of the former wife, Abba, Grandma says she hates you. The children were visiting with their grandparents at that time. Mr. Markell is concerned that continued exposure to such negativity forms a foundation for parental alienation. Is that what he was alleging about your mom? That is what he is alleging in this document. My mom never knew about this motion. Well, you forwarded this motion to your mother I don't believe via I did. email in fact you forwarded this motion to 12 different people your mom jeffrey lacoste renee griggs tova walsh morgan honeycutt gary cohen miguel edmondson trey hubler robert adelson rachel frank jared reich and some m e h u l n y c at yahoo.com so if you weren't worried about this, why'd you send it to all these people? 
I couldn't really say. It's been a long time. And then a couple days later, we know what happened. So this was in March. So a couple days, I filed it, I sent it to people in July when Danny you was You sent it, I'm sorry, you sent it a couple days later. I sent the, I that sent- That email to 12 different people. In March. Yes. So during this back and forth, let me make it a little bit better. Oh, I didn't mean to make it go away. But anyway, <laughs> uh, oh, it's just smaller. Okay. W Wendy has always said that this motion wasn't very scary to her, that she didn't really think that the there would ever be any real legs to it. The judge would never grant it. The judge certainly wasn't going to keep her mother from seeing the grandchildren unsupervised. It was just Dan being angry and filing something bitter, which had been happening back and forth in their divorce proceedings. And so she didn't think it was a, anything significant. So she said that all along. We're going to hear some good cross-examination of her later to explain that. I won't get into that right now. But she, the prosecution brought out a really good point here. If she really was not that upset about it, how odd then that she forwarded it to 12 people. That's a lot of people. If you're not very worried about it, it seems like it, that certainly sounds like you're something that you're really pretty worried about if you send it to 12 different people. This this whole section got a little bit confusing. I'm pretty sure there was an objection right here that I ended up cutting out. And Wendy was very specific that her mother never knew about this motion. Now, the prosecution brought up the great point. It was sent to her mother. Of course, the fact that it was sent to her mother, if you attach a lengthy legal document to an email, most lay people wouldn't read the lengthy legal document. They would just read the email back and forth. So I don't know that that really ends the discussion, but it certainly means that Wendy considered it enough, relevant enough that she sent it around even to her mother. And now they talk, now we're going to talk next about one of the key pieces of evidence against Charlie Adelson, which is a supposed joke that he repeatedly made. So let me go ahead and cue that up. Quote, it was always his joke. He said, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. Is that what he said? That was a joke that he made, yes. And hiring the hitman, that was to kill Dan Markell, right? That was the joke. That was the joke that he made in poor taste, yes. Jeff Lacasse was a person I dated in 2013. And did you tell Jeffrey Lacasse shortly before the actual murder that your brother really had looked into hiring a hitman. I did not. And was the TV that your brother bought you as a divorce present the same TV that was being repaired on the morning of the murder? Yes. Did your mom text you that morning that the repair guy was coming to repair the TV? I don't remember that. Why would your mom have been involved in your TV repair appointment? because I didn't purchase the TV. The TV was a gift that my brother paid for, but my mom went and got it and he reimbursed her. So the contract would have been under her name and her number. This particular joke is particularly damning for Charlie Adelson because it is exactly what happened. He made this joke, oh, I, I might hire a hitman. And then hitman actually went and killed Dan Markell. So it's one heck of a coincidence if he just happened to make this joke and for real, it actually happened. So that's why this is such an important point in the testimony and specifically for Charlie Adelson's trial. Now, the prosecution has really done a lot around this whole issue of the TV. The reason Wendy's alibi for being home on the night, or sorry, being home while Dan Markell was being murdered, her alibi was that she was getting the TV repaired. The prosecution has made a fair significant deal out of this. Jeffrey Lacoste talked about how there was literally, it looked like an elbow into the TV and he didn't see how one of the young boys could possibly have done that. And it seemed to him that maybe it even had been intentional or at least he implied that. I don't know if he ever used the word intentional. I don't fully understand why the prosecution is making such a significant point of this. I guess they want to say that Wendy wanted an alibi as no one thinks Wendy did it. So it's not really all that important 
that she have an al alibi. Everybody believes that two hitmen actually killed Dan Markell. But the state seems to put a lot more significance around this whole TV issue than, than I'm seeing yet. I'm sure there will be more witnesses to talk about it. Okay. And after the murder, do you recall going to it where you got sick at the table? Oh, I cut out the word dinner. About a month Sorry. later, I threw up at the table. All right. And did you ever hear your brother refer to that particular dinner as a celebratory dinner? No. Did you tell Jeffrey Lacoste that your brother called that a celebratory dinner? I did not. Was that dinner a celebration of the murder of your ex-husband? Absolutely not. That dinner was the first time I left my house after over a month because I was terrified. And if it was a celebration of anything, it was a celebration that I was willing to leave the house and eat a meal. This was both good direct examination by the state and good answers by Wendy, both. Now, one thing that's been unclear to me from the beginning is whether it really matters that she became sick. I initially thought maybe they were trying to suggest that this was when it was revealed to her that the family had murdered Dan Markell and it just upset her so much she got ill. I guess that's not it. I guess it just was something so significant that it marked it for everybody. Everybody remembered, oh yeah, that dinner. But they, it doesn't seem like they're trying to say that that part mattered, but that the fact that it was supposedly a celebration of Dan Markell's death. Now that truly would be macabre. I mean, doing something like that would be beyond offensive. I mean, really, really offensive. But I think the jury could believe her explanation that if it was a celebration at all, it was a celebration that she went out and that she doesn't even remember that being said. It certainly was not a celebration of Dan Markell's death. I must say it would be rather brazen of them to truly celebrate it and even mention that to other people. So now we're going to, the next section, we're going to talk about Charlie Adelson's brand new defense trotted out for this particular trial, his, his trial. And he, it's, he says that, and it's a little unclear, but Catherine Mabanawa or the two hitmen and or the two hitmen were blackmailing him that they murdered Dan Markell and then blackmailed Charlie. It's not entirely clear yet how all of that went. I guess that will be more clear during the defense part of the case. Right now, it's still a little bit fuzzy as to exactly how that happened. But some of the absolute best the best questioning by the state came around this issue. So we are about to hear that. When did you learn that Catherine Magbanoa was blackmailing your brother for the murder of your ex-husband? Today. So he never told you? No. You testified in Catherine Magbanoa's murder trial last year, didn't you? I did, yes. And she was convicted? She was convicted, yes. Of murder? Yes, of murder. Of murdering Dan Markell. Of murdering the my crime, children's father, yes. A crime for which she apparently is innocent because she was just a conduit for Sigfredo Garcia. Did you learn that today along with all of us? Well, I learned that someone made that argument. I don't know whether it's true or not true. Okay. You have no knowledge of it. I have no knowledge. In all the years this has been pending. In all of the years this has been pending. Your have... brother has known who killed your child's father, and you didn't know. I did not know. How did the... Now, that seems, as you can imagine, <laughs> a little incredible. But I do want to mention this. Now, the prosecution says that Catherine Mabanawa was innocent. I didn't get that from... And I played it for y'all. I played that clip for you. So you can make your own judgment on that. You can go back one or two videos, and I played that exact clip from the defense opening statement. I thought it was ambiguous at best as to whether Charlie believed she was not actually involved in this extortion scheme against him, this blackmailing, or was she involved? It wasn't totally clear. So I don't, I don't know that we know that answer yet for sure as to what the defense position will be. But overall, I think the prosecution has a great point here. It's shocking that they knew this and that they never mentioned it to Wendy, and she had no idea for all of these years. I just wondered, I would really be interested, please put this in your comments, from that clip, what we just saw, what did you think Wendy's reaction was? Put a put a one or two word description of what you think. I Like, I thought she was, 
it, she seemed kind of annoyed by it to me. I'm just curious whether other people read that or thought of something a little bit different. I would be very interested in what you think about her demeanor right there, because that is critical testimony right there. Killers in this case know that Dan Markell was planning to leave town the day after the killing. I have no idea. You knew he was planning to leave town the next day, didn't you? I did, yes. Did you convey that information to anyone? Absolutely not. That, those right there, there's a series of points, and I just played one of those for you. Great points by the prosecution that the hitman knew a couple of things about Dan Markell. One is that he was leaving town the next day because they testified that they had to complete the murder that day. It had to be that day and they couldn't wait because he was going out of town. The second thing was they knew he was going to the gym. Now, he, Wendy knew that because he had left a message for her saying something like that. So the prosecution points out, look, Wendy happened to know both of those critical facts. And how else, they say, would the hitman have known that? Like, who else would know that he was going to the gym? Who else would know to, to pick him up there, which they did follow him to the gym? So that was a place where they knew he would be going, or at least followed him there. We'll maybe hear more about that. Now, the defense got into some posts that Dan Markell did that did seem to talk about the fact that he was going out of town the next day, but it wasn't clear whether or not they had anything to do with the gym. I don't know that there would be any other way, known way that the killers would have known he would be at the gym unless maybe they followed him to the gym, starting out somewhere different. Did your dad get any big gifts for his 70th? I don't remember. Was the murder of Dan Markell your dad's big gift? I, I mean, that's, of course not. That's a horrible thing to say. What about the, well, what about the grandchildren getting full unfettered access to the grandchildren? My Could parents had full big unfettered gift? access to their grandchildren always. Not when they lived in Tallahassee. Well, whenever they could come up and see them, they did. They were 50% of the time with Dan Markell, right? Sure, but whenever they were with me, they had full unfettered access. Do you? So the state, I, I don't really see this one yet. They seem to be suggesting that their the death of Dan Markell was a gracious gift given to Harvey and was given to uh, the the father of Charlie and the father of Wendy, and that was his seventieth birthday gift. But there's been no hint of that yet. I don't know where that will come in. There may be some witness who ties it together. I don't see it yet. So far, we have Wendy saying, no, that's not it at all. <laughs> now, now they're going to ask Wendy some questions about Jeffrey Lakash. You already heard him mention her, who was her boyfriend at the time of Dan Markell's murder. Remember, she and Dan Markell were divorced by then. Remember on July 13th, 2014, seeing Jeffrey Lacasse at your place on Aqua Ridge. Do you even remember that evening? I don't remember seeing him at my place because by that point we were kind of broken up. So uh, on that occasion, you couldn't have told him you wanted to share something with him in confidence. I think that would be very unlikely. And you couldn't have told him at that time the statement about the your brother really did look into hiring the hitman. I can't imagine I would have said that. Now, we'll get more into this um, throughout the questioning of her. But at this point, he Jeffrey Lacoste says they were, he agrees, they were mostly broken up or sort of broken up, that it was a little bit unclear to him because he was getting very mixed signals. But he agreed that they were definitely struggling in their relationship. And her her point, the, the cross-examination point, really, from Charlie Adelson's attorney was, look, if they're on the outs like this and they really aren't getting along, what are the chances that she would confide in him that her, that her brother really had looked for real into hiring a hitman just a, a year in the past year? What, what would make her suddenly confide that in someone she really wasn't getting along with, didn't have that deep a relationship with and was breaking up with? And you know, I know that people really loved Jeffrey Lacoste. A lot of people thought highly of him. To me, he did seem very much like he was still very angry. The defense wanted to set him up as you believe 
that Wendy Adelson set you up to take the fall. She purposefully went out of her way to arrange for these murders to take place on days when you would be leaving town and driving right by this area because she wanted you to take the fall for it. And so they set it up pretty well that he is angry about this. And he did come across a little bit like that to me. I, if any of you watched it, I would like to know what you thought. Did you think he came across that way? Sort of what was your opinion? Now we're going to get into another of the prosecution's points that on the day of Dan's murder, Wendy Adelson went to a liquor store and bought bullet bourbon. It's spelled a little differently than the device that killed him. It's spelled B-U-L-L-E-I-T, the extra I being in there, and it's a type of bourbon. Now the state wants to suggest she did this as sort of a mocking thing, I guess, knowing he would be killed and then buying bullet bourbon, which she had in her car. I, uh, anyway, you, you can hear her explanation. I was supposed to go to a party that night, a stock the bar party. So I went to a liquor store to pick up what they had asked for as the present for their party. Um, so I went to the liquor store, I picked up the alcohol, I stopped, I think I got gas, and then I went to lunch to meet my friends. They even on cross-examination showed her an invitation, which I guess she still had. And the invitation had apparently, I couldn't see it on the screen, but they talked about it. The words bullet bourbon written up at the top, I guess in handwriting, as if she had been asked specifically to bring that exact type of bourbon. That was the request for her to bring that. This It is creepy as a coincidence, really, really creepy, but I so far, I'm not really picking this up as something that was related to the murder of Dan Markell. It does seem separate, although fully acknowledging that it's a very creepy coincidence, if that's what it is. But the fact that she still had the invitation, now I'll tell you what would be really interesting, if the state could find somebody who says, yeah, that invitation, nobody wrote names of specific types of alcohol at the top. I don't know where that came from. And that would then imply that someone added it later for the purpose of making it look more reasonable. So that would be super interesting testimony. I have no idea whether that will come about or not. When did you decide to change the names of your children from um, Mark Hell to Adelson? So after Danny's murder, there was a lot of news just hit the media and there were news stories everywhere. And Nancy Grace on CNN put pictures of my boys with their faces unblurred, just pictures of them. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified. Dang, Nancy, what's up with that? This is one of the most damning pieces of evidence in the case, I think, for making the case that Wendy Adelson and the Adelsons were basically trying to excise Dan Markell from the lives of these boys. They wanted everything about him gone. They changed the names. According to what I read earlier, they even changed the middle name of one of the boys. So, and that was a tribute to Dan Markell's side of the family, although Wendy argues it was a tribute to both sides of the family. So I can't really answer that, but that was her argument. It does look incredibly cold to just erase the entire paternal side of, of these boys. And it's even more of an issue because he was murdered and because he doesn't have a chance to be part of their lives to for real, that he has no chance to sort of get back involved with them. And then what little they had, their name was erased from them. But she does have an explanation for that, that I think a jury could believe. Some juries would believe that, that, yeah, I can see where after the murder, it would be pretty scary. It would be of concern that people would think, associate you with this violent murder, and maybe it would be better for the boys to separate from that. Now, a couple of, uh, something that didn't come out this time, when she was asked about this earlier, they went a little further and said, well, weren't someone, I think the prosecution said, well, what about Adelson? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty sketchy name too, isn't it? Now that you've been accused of the murder and your uh, brother is on trial for it. And she said, oh, I'm changing all of our names. As soon as we get to the end of this, I'm changing all of our names. It's just not time yet. I thought that was a super good answer and the state didn't ask it this time. So she never got to put that in front of the jury. How soon after the murder did your lawyer advise you not to talk to your family about it? 
in 2016. Okay, so what about the two years in between? Did you talk to him about it then? I mean, I talked to him about the fact that a murder occurred, but I guess I don't understand the question. But you never talked to him about the suspicions you raised in the law enforcement interview that your brother might have done it. No, I did not. I didn't really believe that was possible. I thought this was such a good question from the prosecution. Such a good question. She has always used, Wendy has always used the excuse. I never asked my family about the murder, never pushed them about whether they were involved because I, my lawyers told me not to talk to them about it. So I haven't ever confronted them or asked them about it. But the prosecution points out, well, for two years, you didn't have a lawyer. For two years, you were seeing them all the time and had never been told by anyone, don't talk to them about the murder or whether they were involved. And yet you brought their name up within just, they pointed out 25 pages of, uh, I think it was 200 and something page transcript of her interview with the police. Within 25 pages, she brought up her brother's name. And so if it was that on top of mind, how did you never, ever talk to them about it when no attorney had told you not to. I thought that was really interesting. Her excuse is, well, as I said, lawyer later told us. And by that time, uh, you know, I, I hadn't ever believed that they were really involved. So it's up to you whether you believe that or not. It's just something for you to think about and see what you think. When did you first become aware that you might be a suspect in this case? I mean, as the ex-wife, I assumed I was a suspect from the beginning. What was your first thought when you were asked if anyone might have murdered Dan Markell for your benefit? I thought, oh my God, maybe if I hadn't divorced him, he would still be alive. Maybe, maybe this is my fault because I complained to the wrong person. Maybe Danny gave a student a bad grade and they came after him. I just was trying to think of who possibly could have wanted to hurt him. But you didn't say any of that before. I mean, the first thing you said was Charlie, right? I don't think so. Page 25, line five through 15. I mean, my brother, the one, his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to. He makes a lot of jokes in that taste and it was a joke he made. And you do say you don't think he would do it, but Can we agree you brought up his name on page 25 of the interview? I did. When asked, would you ever ask someone to do something like this? You say not in a million years. When asked, okay, do you think someone would do this for your benefit without asking you? You say no. And when Isom starts to ask you what good does it serve? You say, I mean my brother, the one, his name is Charlie. Isn't that how it went? This is the transcript, but I think there's also inaccuracies in the transcription. All right. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Absolutely. I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired them, right? Not necessarily. Somebody paid them. I learned something this morning. (laughs) Yeah, me too. You didn't want him held accountable if it was your family members. Didn't you tell law enforcement that? If somebody tried to kill my ex-husband, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The investigator says, regardless of who it is, and your answer is, I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother. But I don't think it was my family. It's different now, isn't it? No, it's not different. That's exactly right here. No, that's not right. Just say. So... It is really strange that she mentioned that to to the police immediately, even though she said immediately following that, but I don't think they did it. And I think as fair cross-examination, that next phrase was very important for her to mention if she actually followed it with saying, I didn't think it was my family, because obviously that completely changes the character of bringing up their names. And yet, and yet just bringing up those names is sort of peculiar. I, it wouldn't necessarily be the first thing that would spring to mind when your ex-husband dies. It wouldn't necessarily be that you would think, hmm, wonder if my family had anything. Nah, nah, they wouldn't have done that. It wouldn't necessarily be something that would follow. I also want to say that by the time you get to the point where you're saying there are inaccuracies in the transcript, things are not going well because you that's the lowest rung of the argument that you can make. You'd a lot rather make an argument such as I added this other point, but the one where she makes that there was an inaccuracy. Oh, that's a, that's a very hard argument to make because, 
hey, it's written down, it's typewritten, it seems pretty legitimate to the jury. You know, one of the state's points is that Wendy felt stuck in Tallahassee because Dan Markell had that job, that very uh, prestigious, hard to get job as a law professor at FSU. And she wanted to be out of there. She really wanted to go to South Florida or maybe even some other places. And the defense's way of dealing with that, which has never really been dealt with very well, because in the past, when she's been cross-examined, it was by Katie Mabanawa's attorney or Katie and Siegfriedo's attorney. And it wasn't someone who was specifically wanting to build her up or present her side of the story. It was someone who also wanted, perhaps had reasons to keep her from looking like she was on the up and up. And so this was a little different for this particular set of cross-examination. So here the defense is trying to say, look, you kept a lot of plans in Tallahassee. You did not cancel everything in anticipation of Dan Markell's murder. It isn't like you knew for sure he was going to be murdered. And so you didn't make any plans just in case. Oh, no, no, I hate it when I do that. We'll see how far. <laughs> Five through 15, I mean, my brother, the one, his name is Charlie, the one I'm really close to. No, scoot it up a little bit. All right. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for it up a little further. Of your Investigator says, regardless of who it is, and That's your answer is, I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother. But I don't think it was my family. It's different what I now, isn't it? No, it's not different. That's exactly it's different right here. No, that's not no. right. Just 17 days before the it. murder that the state thinks you participated in. Do you recall that you were excited that a friend of yours was moving to Tallahassee? I do. Do you recall uh, setting up dates for mm -hmm. the week or so after July 18th? I did. In the spring and summer of 2014, you were working with a local realtor to buy a house in Tallahassee, right? I was. I'm showing you what's marked as defense exhibits six and seven. Now, um, in early 2013, you were appointed a clinical professor by the FSU faculty. That's right. And you had plans to teach at the law school in the fall of 2000. Yes. Your book was selected 14. by FSU. Sorry for what was called the One Book, One Campus event, right? That's right. I was supposed to speak at um, convocation in August. Do you recall that your parents and Charlie were quite excited to come watch you in Tallahassee at this event they in were. August? Yes. That was pretty effective cross-examination, I felt like, showing that Wendy had a lot of things going on in Tallahassee and some really good ones, like being asked to speak at convocation. And he's also pulling in Charlie and the parents and everybody was focused on her living in Tallahassee, not focused on the idea that she would quickly be moving down to South Florida because Dan Markell would be dead. That's fairly, I thought that was pretty effective cross-examination of her, fairly effective at showing she had a reason to stay there when the state in the past has suggested she very much didn't. And Jeffrey Lacoste said she didn't want to stay there either. With regards to the motion that Professor Markell filed, claiming that you and your attorney filed a false affidavit, this did back you get the sense that you were going to prevail on that litigation? Yes. Was the judge getting frustrated with Professor Markell on that litigation? Very. Did the judge admonish Professor Markell regarding that litigation? The judge said he needed to stop. Were you concerned about getting disbarred? No. Are you and I have to say that just from a lawyer's perspective, it does seem very kind of unlikely that they're going to disbar somebody because of their back and forth in a heated custody dispute, because I think mostly people would realize that that's pretty likely to be people blaming back and forth. And they're going to want to get that resolved in the family court, in the divorce court, not in the state bar and not in terms of people's law licenses. So I, that does seem, I, I wouldn't say never, that it would never be that someone's law license would be taken away if they made re misrepresentations to a court in a divorce proceeding. It just doesn't seem like all of this is very likely. I, I think 
There was also testimony from Jeffrey Lacoste saying, yeah, that's pretty much what he thought too. All the lawyers seem to think now this was not very likely to happen. So I had not heard um, the some of this information before about the judge having said those things to Professor Markell. I don't know to the extent that he actually said that or whether there's a transcript of that. This was just Wendy recounting it. So we didn't actually have a transcript. Isn't it true that, you know, on page 52 at line 17, the judge said, hey, cut it out, Dan Markell. You're really going too far. We didn't have anything like that. She just stated that he had been admonished. Now, the next part that I'm going to show you goes back to Charlie Adelson and his new defense, and it's absolutely fascinating. I'm going to, this will be my final section, then I'm going to make a few comments, but if you have questions, this would be a great time to put them in there with some question marks at the front, so I have a better shot of, of seeing them. Are you mad? Are you, are you angry that according to your brother's theory, he and your mom have known who killed your children's father since 2014, and you weren't told who it was? I'm more angry that somebody killed my children's father. Good answer. So you're not mad about that, that they knew this whole time? Smart to pursue. That's what they're saying. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? That's the theory of the defense in this case, is that that he's known the whole time. Your brother's known what happened to Dan. Does that make you angry? I'm angry about so many things. It's hard to Is that one of them? separate them. Well, try. I'm confused. It's hard to process. And apparently, according to his lawyer, these killers had threatened to kill your brother's family members as well. Did you hear that? I did hear that. And that would be you, right? It would. Were you told that a specific threat had been made by the same people that had killed your ex-husband to kill your brother's family members? I was not told. Would that have been information you would have liked to know back in 2014? Yes. Would you have made the same decision to move down to South Florida closer to the killers? No, I would not. And even after the killers were arrested in 2016, you weren't told that that's what was going on the whole time. I found out yesterday. Huge, huge admission on the part, a brilliant examination, I think, by the state's attorney, really well done. And uh, Wendy held her own for a while, but then in the end, the admission that she would not have gone to South Florida had she known that she was moving closer to the killers, huge admission, and certainly tends to make Wendy, and, and which would be her goal, I presume, make Wendy seem less likely to have been involved in it, but really significant admission because it does hurt Charlie Adelson's whole argument because it does seem like maybe he would have revealed that to his family members had they been in danger. So I'm going to take a look real quickly at some of the questions and see what I have in there. I'm looking for those question marks. Do you think the defense helped this case for the state? I felt like the defense did really well on a couple of witnesses, particularly Jeff Lacoste. Great cross-examination of him, particularly when he was recalled. We're going to get into that in just one second. And let's see what else. So I don't think so. Now, if you mean by that defense by Charlie Adelson, is that going to help the prosecution? No, but I'm not convinced yet that it's going to make it anywhere. I'm not sure about that. What did I think of the court demeanor of the defense lawyer, I think is what uh, hey, Mona is asking me. I, I felt like he did fine. I, he was he got kind of loud, and a few times he got called down. Uh, There's no need to yell. <laughs> the judge said that to him, and I think some of the, the jury may have even said that to him one time. It was unclear to me who was saying something to him. He's like, okay, I'll be quieter. But I thought it may, he got really animated at exactly the time he needed to. So I thought overall that it, he was he was doing well with that. I, I thought he was getting better as time went on too. I thought his cross-examination was improving. So Charlie Delta Whiskey, we are about to get into that. We are about to get into your very questions. So Pat just has questions. Uh-oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know what your question is, Pat. Um, there were just question marks. I, if I spot your name in here, I'll go back. 
What is my going out music? Debbie wants to know. You know, I do not know the name of that. I will try to find that. Um, I like it too. Oh, you like it and keep it on longer. Okay. Well, I do notice that the there's a drop off in people watching, you know, as I, as I go into the final music, but I like it too. I really enjoy it. So I think I've gotten most of our questions. Let's say, oh, wait, here's a new one from Kitty saying a contested transcript of an interrogation can be proven with the video. Well, sure. That's a good point. If she wanted to say that she didn't say something, if there was video of her being interrogated, she could play that video and say, look, you can hear what I'm saying. I'm saying something different from what they wrote down. They just made an error. Absolutely. That's a good point. That could be done. I don't know if she has the motivation to do that. Oh, Janet, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll stick that on the screen. Defense blamed Rivera for planning the murder as well as being part of the murder. How, do you, how well do you think the Latin King tapes are being used? Are, don't you figure it was Sigfredo Garcia that they were blaming? I wasn't clear on that. I haven't really figured out. They might have been saying Katie Mambanawa was planning it. It was really unclear. And I think I, I got the impression he wasn't even sure which which it was I, because it was never a super clear answer on that. I remain confused too. So thank you, Janet. And I see I I'm I also have a super chat from Vicky. I don't I'm trying to figure out how to find it so I can put it on the screen. Anyway, Vicky Andres asked me, how do you think Wendy came across to the jury? You know, I think this, I think that she has come across a little worse each time because her answers weren't as easy and the answers, let me just a second. Let me see if I can. Okay. Maybe that was why I couldn't do it. Well, anyway, Vicki, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't figure out how to put it. Oh, I know what I can do. There we go. There's Vicki's question. Okay. So I think that she came across a little worse for the wear because the prosecution knows how she's going to respond and knows how she's going to answer. But she is a phenomenal witness. That's what I say. And I know I get a lot of heat for that. Oh, Wendy's terrible. Well, you know, I think you just have to say what you what you see. I see her as a good witness, as someone who is effective at being a witness. Is she perfect? Is she making some admissions as time goes on? Yep, she sure is. And so obviously that's going to get harder and harder as time goes on. Let me go back over to the questions over here. Did I miss any? Mar oh, Marlon, just telling people to put in questions, not asking a question. Okay, down the rabbit holes. Oh, you already answered that one. Let's see. Pizza driver. Wish she was asked who was supposed to take the kids that night. I actually heard that. I think the answer was they did a stipulation on who took the kids when. She was supposed to pick the kids up from, from their preschool. He had taken the kids and she was picking them up. I guess they were having an exchange because he was going out of town. So she was, she was the one who was picking the kids up that day. So let's see, is there anything else that I have not answered? Oh, here's one. Oh, how, oh, that was Pat May wanting to know how Wendy came across. And let's see. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of questions here. I don't know if I will get to all of them. Do you think that the DA is keeping a lot bat that she has on Wendy? I'll be honest. I don't, I don't think she is keeping a lot bat, but I think that they're trying to build their case and each, piece is another piece that they hope falls into place and makes it easier. They clearly believe that Wendy is involved. I don't think I'm revealing any state secret by telling you that. I think it was real clear that they believed that and do believe that. And let's see. So is Wendy going to be indicted? I can't answer that except that the state wants to. That's what I, how I read the situation. Nancy think both lawyers are funny, sarcastic, and very loud and dramatic. That's probably, probably pretty accurate. And let's see, let's keep going. Anything else? I think I'm about to the end of the questions. Why wasn't the mother called? Oh, oh, the mother wasn't called because, in fact, the mother was on both sets of witness lists, State and Charlie Adelson's. Donna was going to be, at least was on the witness list, but the State had the right to ask her questions in some questioning in advance, and 
she, they didn't want to. Um, I mean, Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson didn't want to come and answer those questions. And so there ultimately was a decision by everybody. Okay. We're just going to not have, nobody will bring you to trial because the defense couldn't bring them unless they were willing to come and submit to this questioning. So they just, in the end said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. So Janet is saying, thanks for the coverage. You, you are welcome. And I'm so glad that you have enjoyed it. Now, I want to talk for just a minute about an extra point. Let's see. Have I, I think I should Charlie have taken a deal. He looks so guilty. I don't know that he was offered one. I'm, I don't know. I don't know if he, if anybody offered him a deal on that. Are Donnie, Donna and Charlie guilty of withholding evidence from an investigation? Great question. Great question. I don't know. And particularly if they were interrogated, if they were asked questions about what happened and they made false statements, that could certainly be something that comes back to haunt them. Okay. So I want to talk for just a minute about how I'm going to handle coverage of the trial going forward. Now, I would love to be court TV when I grow up, but what I've found is I was trying yesterday to cut off my coverage at noon so that I could do the video of Wendy because I really wanted to include video, not just talk, but also show you some video clips because I think it's so helpful. But And I figured it would take me all afternoon to do that since I go live at 7 and trial doesn't end until 5.30, 6 o'clock. But I need a crew of people. I am unfortunately not, in fact, court TV. That's not who I am. So yesterday, I really wanted to show you that, but I had a lot of trouble with getting the technology to work so I could load it up and show it to you. With all the technical difficulties, I ended up just going live and telling you about what I had seen before noon. Well, then I go back and watch it. And I'm like, dang it. The point that I made to you was that Wendy had, that the state wanted two important pieces of testimony out of Jeffrey Lacoste. The defense objected. And wouldn't, and the court said, nope, I'm not going to let him talk about that. And I said at the time, but the trial isn't over and it could be that witnesses get recalled and it could be that testimony comes in later. But I talked about the fact that this, these two pieces of evidence had been ruled out and it may come in later. And that's what happened. That's exactly the way trial is because it's very fluid and a piece of evidence that isn't relevant right now may be relevant later. A piece of evidence that isn't yet admissible or proven or authenticated maybe all of those things later. And so that's what happened. They ended up recalling Wendy. They recalled Jeffrey Lacoste and got in the two points that they wanted Jeffrey Lacoste to make. Those were that she, she denied asking to speak to Lacoste confidentially just days before the murder while they were in the middle of breaking up and telling him that Charlie really had for real explored all options of getting rid of Dan Markell, including hiring a hitman, which would have cost either 15000 or 50000 Lacoste was unclear. He didn't remember what the number was. Second thing that she had said, that dinner one month after Dan Markell's murder was a celebration dinner. That was why they had it, was to celebrate. And that Charlie called it that, called it a celebration dinner. Now, Lacoste came back on. They asked him those questions, and he said, she told me those things and the defense got into, well, Jeffrey Lacoste has a whole lot of reason. So this is my plan going forward. Instead of trying to do the videos, which are taking me too long to edit, and I'm going to have to cut off at noon in order to get the videos included, which then means I miss the second half of the day and I can't put that on until the next day. So I think I'm going to do it more like Murdoch, where I do one full day and if I can possibly do some videos for you, I really will. I would be interested in your thoughts on that if you want to put them in. But I have to say that <laughs> your thoughts are really important to me. Very, very important. But I literally am probably not able to do that because it's so much time. It's so time consuming for me to do the videos at the same time that I'm watching the trial, which I watch on double speed anyway, and have to keep going back and watching little sections that I miss. So that's my thought. And your input is greatly appreciated. Let me know what you think. I want to thank Cheryl Brady for her super sticker. 
So thank you all again for subscribing, for liking the videos. It's so helpful. It really helps the videos get out to more people. And I love having you come back for the lives. We're going live at 7 p.m. every day during the trial. And I look forward to seeing you at 7 o'clock on Monday. I also want to thank Marlon and Mama Pinks. And here's that music you were asking.